wanna finish what you started? You came to the right place. Them girls that you came with, you might have to part with. Depending on how this thing shakes. Wabatosa, Kenosha, Economy Walk is in the house. Hey everybody, and thank you for all those who have tuned in to yet another episode of the New Look Podcast. We've got a special episode in store for you today, but before I begin, I want to provide a little bit of context. Last fall, long before the new look had come to life, uh, I had the idea for a podcast focused on interviewing retiring members of Congress. And in so doing, I hoped to not only learn about their careers, but also get their thoughts on the institution of Congress and how we can make it work better. I am fascinated by congressional reform. I'm fascinated by the evolution or devolution of the institution, as it were. Uh, And so I thought this would be a great way to learn more about that and potentially write about it after interviewing retiring members. And so rather than doing an ongoing podcast, I thought sort of a short term series interviewing all the Republicans and Democrats who are leaving Congress would be interesting and different. Uh, And so I convinced some of my colleagues to take some time to speak with me. And even though I had no idea what the podcast would look like, let alone what we would call the podcast, um, Uh, We got three conversations recorded before the coronavirus forced me to change plans. It was extraordinarily difficult to schedule even those three and get two members of Congress in the same room. That probably tells you something interesting about how the institution works or doesn't work. Uh, But while the topic of the podcast has changed, I still found the conversations I had with my colleagues to be fascinating, and I think you will too. And so over the next few weeks, I want to share these discussions with you in a special series of interviews with retiring members. And first up is my colleague, Greg Walden. Uh, Greg represents Oregon's second congressional district. He was first elected to Congress in 1998. He has had quite the career uh, spending time as chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee and chairman of the NRCC. And far and away has the best radio podcast voice of anyone to come on. I I sort of want him to record just, you know, uh, audio books that I could fall asleep to every night. So with that in mind, I hope you enjoy today's special episode of The New Look. We are here with the great (laughs) Congressman Greg Walden. Uh, This is the first interview that I'm doing. Uh, The goal of this whole thing is to interview all the members that are retiring, get their thoughts on their career, and most importantly, get their thoughts on the institution of Congress, Mm -hmm. uh, Congress, the good, the bad, the ugly, how it's changed over time. And we are honored to have Greg Walden as our first guest. I don't even know what I'm calling this, Greg. But the reason that it's fitting that that we have you as the first guest is because, as I understand it, you have a background in radio broadcasting. Please explain that. True. My wife and I were in the business for uh, 21 years doing uh, radio out in Oregon. My father started in the 1930s as a radio engineer. So I grew up around towers and transmitters and small market radio. And, uh, you know, my colleagues, our colleagues, say I have a voice for radio and a face, too. (laughs) So some of them aren't very nice. We can talk about that later. But it's a great institution. I'm a big fan of uh, uh, broadcasting and and what it does in the communities. And we had a great run, 21 years as owners and operators of a small radio company in in the Northwest. And did you have to sell that when you got elected, or didn't did have that? to? Yeah. But uh, it's a hands-on business, especially that size. And and uh, my wife and I ran it. She was there full time. I was doing public service work uh, during some of those years. And and uh, just as we grew from two stations to three to five, and. Uh, it's just a lot, and we decided, you know, after 21 years, it was okay uh, to, to move on. Uh, so let's uh, back up a little bit from that. I also, in the, the you know, the massive research team that I have in preparation for these, <laughs> I you and, the, you and my father. Yeah, you and Father Google. <laughs> um, is it true that you're, li- you're like a sixth or seventh generation Oregonian? Is that even the right well, term? That's, yeah, yes and no. Yeah. So my ancestors came to Oregon in 1845. Wow. Uh, by wagon train. Uh, my great great grandmother wrote a book, The Autobiography and Reminiscences of Sarah J. Cummins, which was printed and is, I guess, available in different outlets. But when she was in her 90s, I think she wrote it. Now, here's the problem with uh, uh, I want to be factually correct. So while they arrived in 1845, um, they actually crossed the line over into Washington State, and that's where my father was born. Mm. And so I'm, I'm, I may be first-generation Oregonian because 
uh, even though they were around in the neighborhood. They lived in Oregon. They came there in 1845, but literally went across the river, and he was born uh, uh, over the over Ridge Line and, and into uh, Prescott, Washington. And uh, my mother was born in, in uh, La Grande, Oregon. Oh, no, she was born in Burley, Idaho. I take that back. Uh, they moved to La Grande later. So my wife's ancestors, my ancestors, they all kind of came in and out of the Northwest or came to the Northwest uh, in the 1840s. And uh, and settled somewhere there, but of course, one time it was all the Oregon Territory. We <laughs> we kiddingly say we we got rid of the parts that weren't that great. That'd be Washington State. Well, I from a know. Midwestern perspective, everything yeah. west of the Rockies is just strategic depth. That's so I right. really don't even care about the state <laughs> distinctions. Uh, um, so where where did you grow up then? And in- uh, a small town, Hood River, uh, Oregon, uh, and the Dalles. Or I was born in the Dalles, twenty miles away is Hood River. When uh, my father left as a, a manager of KODL Radio, uh, he was able to buy a small market station 20 miles away in Hood River. That was 1967. We moved there a year later after the family uh, ch- small cherry orchard sold. And uh, then so I started seventh grade in Hood River and graduated from Hood River Valley High School in 1974. And then you went to University of Oregon. Well, first of all, I went to the University of Alaska at Fairbanks for okay. a year. Yeah, and worked in radio and TV uh, full-time while I was going to college full-time. Uh, and that was the height of the construction of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. And I want to tell you what, I'd never been in a quote-unquote gold rush town, but that was one. And uh, these these uh, pipeline workers would come out of those camps after eight or nine weeks, uh, holed up, and their first stop was downtown Fairbanks. And it was wild. And then they'd have a ticket out somewhere warm, and uh, and off they'd go to Hawaii or somewhere, but there's always a night or two in Fairbanks, and so you can imagine the money and the wildlife. And I was just this 17-year-old college kid, you know, in the in the Northward Building, working at the mighty 90 KFRB and and uh, KTVF Television, uh, did both, and uh, it was it was a real eye opener. I uh, I'm mean, just imagining then something akin <laughs> akin Oregon. to. Um, to the Wild West out there. Yeah, it, well, part of it was every uh, every law enforcement, local law enforcement got hired up by mm-hmm. the pipeline camp folks, so Bechtel and Alyeska. Uh, they hired up anybody with law enforcement to go do security in the various pipeline camps. And then uh, if you had any kind of uh, news background, public relations, whatever, um, they also hired you to go do their PR. So I'd grown up in radio. I was on the air at age 15, and and so at 17, I, I got went to college and got hired. We had a friend that worked at, a friend of my cousin's worked at that radio and TV station. We just went to see it, and they literally hired me almost on the spot. Uh, that was August 74, and, and so, because uh, I'd been on the air, and they just needed people. And wow. so it gave me a great opportunity to do both radio and TV. Wow. So you go to U of O after Then that. I went to the University of Oregon I, to, to warm up, thaw out. Yeah. And, uh, you founded Nike, you became a billionaire. No, the rest no, no, history. But, no, no. I oh, do no, know so, Phil Knight. Someone else, I yeah. did know Bill Bowerman. So. <laughs> um, were you one of these kids in college that, ha- I mean, it sounds like you always had a passion for radio and broadcasting, but did you have a passion for politics at the same time? Was this? Well, did you envision at that point that one day you might be in elected office? No. How did that start? Uh, well, it's a long tail. Uh, there is a genetic disorder along the way. My father got elected to the Oregon legislature in 1970 when I was in middle school. So I grew up in a family that was both small market uh, radio broadcasting, uh, very involved in the community through that. But also then that led uh, my father to run for the state legislature and get elected. So I kind of grew up around public service and a whole notion of giving back to the community. My mother was a volunteer uh, in, in what they called the Gray Ladies. It was a Red Cross offshoot uh, that, that did a lot of projects and work. And, and she also worked at the radio station some uh, over the years. Um, and for my father in the, in the legislature for the six years he was there. So I grew up around that era of public service. But when I, I went into journalism, uh, that's what my degree is in. And uh, I, I think if I, at that time, I, I was thinking more in terms of, uh, I, I thought it'd be fun to be a foreign correspondent somewhere, see the world and write about it. That never happened, by the way. Um, but I ended up getting pulled into, into campaigns and politics, my father's, and then uh, from that, I ended up uh, doing uh, some writing uh, in, in one of the leadership offices at the state legislature, and that led to a, two campaigns for governor. The guy I went to work for initially lost in the primary, and, and the one who won hired me to do speech writing and stuff, and, and I was all of 21, I think, and he got elected governor, and then I 
did led the communications effort in the Republican office, state legislature, the next session, and they ended up getting involved in congressional campaign, and you know ended up back here as press secretary, and then later chief of staff, and then went home, bought the family radio business. My wife and I did, and I thought I was done with politics, and lo and behold, I was running for the legislature a year or two later and got elected. So. And who'd you work for when you were a staffer here? You know, here, uh, Denny Smith. He was a F-4 fighter pilot in Vietnam. He was a commercial airline co-pilot and flight engineer for Pan Am. He uh, owned and operated a uh, family newspaper company in Oregon, uh, later Washington and Idaho, um, and, and ironically owned the newspaper in my hometown where w- my parents owned the radio station. So, in effect, we were competitors in some ways. But uh, I learned a lot from him. He uh, was a real leader in an effort for military reform. He teamed mm-hmm. up with uh, then Senator Gary Hart of Colorado and led the Military Reform Caucus uh, because as a, as a veteran, as a fighter pilot, as a Vietnam uh, combat pilot, he was really frustrated with equipment that didn't work when we put men and women in harm's way. And his whole focus was on rooting out um, bad behaviors at the Pentagon uh, and, uh, and, and making sure weapon systems and equipment that was being developed was being honestly developed. We developed a lot of uh, contacts uh, behind the lines, uh, if you will, and identified projects that were completely off the rails. Uh, and, and data that was being falsified. Wow. And, I mean, it was really quite a, quite a time. Well, so you, you see Congress from, uh, from the perspective of a staffer. You mm-hmm. go back to Oregon. You get elected to the state legislature yeah. after, serve, after going back to business and uh, owning a radio right. station. Um, and then at what point do you have the opportunity to run for Congress yourself? Well, and what went into that yeah, decision? Yeah, so, so I spent eight years in the Oregon legislature, six in the House, two in the Senate. Um, and uh, I guess it was 1996. I, I toyed with it in 94, brief, but only very briefly. Um, and in, in 96, I actually formed a third party in two and a half weeks to run because the <laughs> incumbent uh, turned out to be uh, pretty much fraud. And incumbent Republican, and uh, it was after our filing deadline, and he'd won the nomination when all these things started coming about. Did out. your third party have a cool name, like Bull Moose? Or, uh, no, it was it? really boring. It was Second Congressional District Party. <laughs> um, it was not about a new philosophy or anything, but we collected double the number of signatures in two and a half weeks or something like that because he wouldn't give up the nomination. And uh, it's a long tale, but uh, he lied about his service overseas. He wow. lied about his degree. He lied about, it turned out, about 80% of what he said was true. It was the other 20 that was really problematic. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he ended up going to prison for fraud and, and some other things and violated our Oregon statute on elections, and that was a felony. And I mean, it was just a whole deal. Wow. But anyway, he, he eventually gave up the nomination. And, his immediate predecessor, Bob Smith, not to be confu- confused with Denny Smith, um, came out of retirement. Uh, Greengrich uh, encouraged him to do that, and he came back and, and was elected uh, in 96 and chaired the Ag Committee, which he had served on in the minority for his whole career. And uh, after one year, basically announced he wasn't going to run again. He called me uh, just ahead of that to say, I'm announcing I'm not running again. I'm going to publicly endorse you to replace me. hope you run. Let me know what you decide. <laughs> Uh, there's a whole bunch more to the tale. But anyway, so I ended up running in 98 and uh, started nine points down in February and won by 22 in a crowded primary wow. in May and then went on to win the general 60%. So. And your district, you are the only Republican in the state of Oregon. In the state of Oregon, but your in, district in is massive geographically. It would right? stretch, uh, if you overlaid it over the East Coast, it would stretch from the Atlantic to Ohio. It's larger than any state east of the Mississippi except Michigan because you got to count the lake. But it is, uh, it is big. It's it, it's huge. It's and huge. give us a sense uh, ideologically of, of how what's the makeup? Has that changed since you first got elected in ninety? It's changed. Yeah, it's it's ch- it's in the process of changing. Because uh, you have Ashland, which I imagine is a pretty Ashland. Yeah, I, I, liberal. I, 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 always, I, I used to be the top Republican vote getter in Ashland, which was about eight or nine or ten percent. Uh, it's a wonderful. And I, I got asked by a reporter after one election where I'd won the district by. I think over 70 percent that particular time and only gotten, I don't know, 10, 15 percent in Ashland. They said, how do you explain it, Congressman? And I said, well, it's real simple. I love Ashland more than Ashland loves me. 
And it's true. I mean, it's a great university town. It's the home of the Oregon Shakespearean Theater that, that puts on more performances. I think this is, is accurate than any theater company in the, wow. in the country. Um, so there's a lot of theater and drama and uh, a lot of Californians moving up for that. There's a wonderful university, but it's just liberal, and yeah. I'm not. And that's okay. Um, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful town. It's a beautiful community. So is it still on balance or a Republican It's a Republican district, district that voted for Trump, uh, President Trump, in the 2016 election by maybe close to 20 points. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would, as of October, uh, probably uh, reelect the president by a sizable margin, probably not 20, but mm -hmm. it would be, it'd be uh, 8 or 10 right now. And uh, it's a Republican district. It's rural, but it is changing. Uh, Bend has grown dramatically. Medford's grown dramatically. So central and eastern Oregon and a lot of uh, folks from California moving in, uh, others from Portland moving over. I mean, the, so the politics are changing, but uh, and, and the, the economy is changing a lot. We, it's 55 percent controlled by the federal government, federal forest lands, Bureau of Land Management lands, and they've shut down timber harvest by any measurable amount. So that whole era that, that Oregon was, was proud of in the, in the timber industry, all that has just sort of died away. And the rural communities that were timber dependent lost the mills, lost the jobs, and have never really fully recovered. But it's an ag, it's an ag, ag economy. Um, we, we grow just about everything but tropical fruits. I mean, we have over 200 crops wow. in Oregon. Uh, very diverse agricultural base. Uh, uh, grass seed, onion seed, carrot seed, peppermint, potatoes, onions, cattle, cherries, apricots, peaches, pears, I mean, uh, wine grapes, uh, you name it. it. It's just really diverse. And so, um, okay, we've gotten you from the Oregon Trail, you know, killing bison and avoiding yeah, dysentery to getting elected to Congress in 1998. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what our, our vast listenership, I don't even know who's going to be listening to this by the time we're releasing, <laughs> may not know is that from 1998 to the present day, you've held almost every major position of power, I would say, from my perspective, as a younger, newer member in the House of Representatives, you were the NRCC chair, and we can get into that. But perhaps most notably, you were uh, chairman and now ranking member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, yeah. which is, I would say, one of the most powerful yeah committees in the House of Representatives, yep. with the possible exception of appropriation and ways and means. It has vast jurisdiction yeah. over everything. But when you came in as a new member, a freshman member, right. was it your ambition to serve on that committee? Yes. How did you think about, yeah. you know, maybe one day being a subcommittee chair or committee chair? And just kind of take you know, me through that funny. process. It's kind of funny you asked that, because uh, I remember one day uh, the chairwoman, Barbara Cuban of Wyoming, of the telecommunications subcommittee uh, agreed to, to meet with me, and my staff was just beside themselves. Oh, my gosh, the, the subcommittee chairwoman's going to come. And actually, it was an event I think she was coming to. But anyway, be that as it may, uh, and, and I was excited. It's like, oh, my gosh, because this is somebody of real power, and, and these are issues I care a lot about. It's everything from satellites to cell phones, broadcasting mm -hmm. to cable, all the issues I, I was really interested in. And she had agreed to meet with us and talk to us about it. And I never thought I would eventually chair that subcommittee and the full committee before mm. uh, my service would be complete here. But I did. Um, and Energy and Commerce has the broadest jurisdiction of any committee in the Congress. So we have uh, principal jurisdiction over most health care issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we have principal jurisdiction over everything from National Institutes of Health. Uh, to the Food and Drug Administration. We have jurisdiction over the electricity grid and a lot of the EPA programs. And, and so it's from food safety to safe drinking water, from um, brownfields uh, cleanup, um, and, and then you go on, on through. And, and w so we have telecommunications, satellite cell phones, you got the electric grid, you got healthcare. Um, so you, all these sectors. And it, it, for somebody with a curious mind, it's a wonderful place mm -hmm. to serve. And, uh, and you touch all kinds of policy. I never thought I'd be chairman of the committee. That's, mm -hmm. that's for, you know, somebody old. Um, now, 21 years later, I've been chairman, and now I'm the top Republican because we're in the minority. Uh, and you don't even look that old. No, thank you. Thank you. Idea. Thank you. Your viewers, <laughs> your listeners can hear that. Uh, but it's, it's a great committee, and, uh, and, and I, the service is wonderful. But it's one that uh, 
does a lot of bipartisan work. Like we did the whole opioids uh, legislation in the last Congress, which I, I led on HR6. And we took about 50 some bipartisan pieces of legislation that members like yourself and others had come up with to attack this issue of, of people dying in our communities through mm-hmm. overdose of opioids. And how do we get them treatment? And how do we get better pain management practices? And how do we shut off the illegal fentanyl coming in primarily from China? Um, It's one thing after another. We put that whole package together. We passed it. It became law. 148 pieces of legislation went through our committee under my chairmanship. 93% had bipartisan votes on the House floor. And most of that body work became law. Yeah. Which is remarkable because I think, and I, I want this, this, these interviews are primarily intended to be about the institution of Congress, but I think in part, I mean, energy and commerce is so powerful because, I mean, with the broadest jurisdiction over healthcare and the fact that we're spending most of our money on That's healthcare, right. it occupies an outsized right. space in the debate. Right. Um, I think personally, I think healthcare remains our most vexing issue uh, I agree. because it is so ubiquitous and it's so complex mm-hmm. and it really requires you to dig in deep and understand and this place doesn't often allow people to spend time doing that. I just I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, given the contentious debate we had on healthcare in the last mm-hmm. Congress, where do you think the party needs to go on healthcare? Not just in a political context yeah. twenty twenty, but as you look back on that debate, are there any areas you think we do lessons learned that would inform what we should do going yeah, forward? I, I think so. Um w- where I think not only the party but the country needs to go is to figure out why are these costs so yeah. outrageous. And, you know, we're, we're seeing that in the cost of pharmaceutical drugs. And we've never had a president lean in more on that issue than Donald Trump has to try and get drug prices down. I've been in multiple meetings with him. I've been in meetings with the CEOs of the pharmaceutical companies and the president in the Roosevelt Room at the White House and then the Oval Office for an hour and a half where he's pounding on them. Uh, and we're finally seeing drug costs uh, overall begin to, to top out, um, but that's still way too high in some categories. Cost of health care. So you got drugs, but you also have hospital stays and everything else. One of the things we're working on right now is this issue of surprise medical billing, mm. where one out of five people going to an emergency room gets a bill that is not covered by their insurance when they thought their insurance had them covered. And uh, these are outrageous situations. We had a woman testify a few months ago on this, that when the birth of their second child, a little boy, uh, she said, my husband and I made sure we had the doctor in network, we had the in, uh, the hospital was in network, everything was covered. Well, the little boy had a, a, a emergency after birth, and the doctor came in and said, we've got to take your son to the neonatal intensive care unit just, just down the hall over there um, to, to see what's going on. And good news, he was stabilized. Uh, turned out he was hemophiliac, so he had to have you know the, the, the bleeding disorder, and they got him stabilized. But a month later, she got a $50,000 bill. Why? Because the hospital was in, covered by her insurance, but what was neglected to be disclosed was the neonatal intensive care unit inside that hospital had been contracted out to a third party that was not covered by her insurance. And she said, how am I supposed to know that? And what was I supposed to do differently? When the doctor comes in and says, your newborn is bleeding out, yeah. and we got to deal with this, what are you going to do? Yeah. And she got the bill. That's wrong. It's another woman who got a $17,800 bill for a, a lab test her doctor ordered and sent to a lab that wasn't covered by her insurance. She didn't have any say over that. It's about a $100 test. Seventeen thousand dollars. Wow! So we have legislation to put take the patient out of that mix and put a stop to this bad behavior, um, and it's moving forward. But cost of health care, and and here's something that that those of you who are going to continue on here need to figure out, and we as a country need to figure out. We have done amazing investments in basic science research through the National Institutes of Health and their grants that go out to our universities and everywhere else. And then the pharmaceutical companies come along and take that basic research in some cases and develop the clinical trials and the drug tests. And with with the incredible amount of data, the enormous computing capacity we have, the science that we've, we've developed to look at the genetic d- decode, the whole DNA, we're going to get to where they will develop a medicine that only works on you. But boy, does it work on you. And one that just is made for me. We have not figured out how to pay for that. Mm. And you can harangue this company or that actor or whatever, and yes, there are issues we need to deal with in that space. But over the horizon where the researchers and innovators in America are, are cures to diseases we never thought we would ever cure, things Mm. like sickle cell anemia, pancreatic cancer, 
um, uh, ALS, Alzheimer's, on and on and on. And, and these innovators see this. They know we're on the edge. They can see a path in many cases. They're not there yet, but they're seeing paths. But we, as policymakers, have got to figure out how do we pay for that. And there are some interesting concepts, and I'm challenging some of these think tanks that have really smart yeah. people and say, how do you do this? Yeah, Because we want the cure. Or at least have enough transparency to understand who's currently paying for it and right. where the money is going. And I think transparency... But if I can, if, if I can uh, turn around Alzheimer's, yeah. how much is that worth to you as the patient, but overall to the country? Yeah. If, if we could fix that, because it's trillions in projected costs going forward. Yep. And if we could figure out how to stop Alzheimer's, wow. Well, we could spend a whole podcast talking about health care, and I do hope you'll continue to speak out on those issues after you leave Congress, because you know more about it than any other member yeah, here. Um, <laughs> one, just one quick yeah. policy area before we transition to institutional issues. Would you have, my timing may be totally wrong here, would you have been here then as a freshman for the Clinton impeachment, or so my career will be bookended by impeachment. Is that right? That's wild. Uh, I was 21 years ago, uh, December 19th, 1998, wow. when Bill Clinton, when the House voted to impeach Bill Clinton. Uh, the House voted on December 18th, uh, uh, 2019, uh, to impeach Donald Trump. Now I arrived in January of uh, 1999, so one of my first votes on the House floor was to send the impeachment managers over to the Senate to prosecute the case. Now, I did not vote on impeachment itself. But that had been done by the House before I got here. But the next vote was to send the managers over. And the managers are our colleagues um, who are chosen to go over to the Senate and become basically prosecutors making the case. Uh, and the court uh, is, is the Senate, and they are, they're the jury. So was was uh, Jim Sensenbrenner one of the managers? I believe he was. And do you have uh, you done more Rogan, town halls than Jim? Is that a claim? No, he I think has gotten ahead okay. of me again. All but, right. yeah. You know, when he had his hip <laughs> surgery, I, I eclipsed him. I did forty town halls in in twenty nineteen. I was right at the top of the wow. list in the Congress, um, and and all. But uh, so yeah. I I assume the Clinton, uh, even though you didn't vote on initial Correct. impeachment, does that sort of is that a lens through which you view the current? In part. part. And, yeah. and if you go back and look, remember, he was a, accused of perjury. And, and uh, I, I, I'd have to pull up all of them. Mm-hmm. But um, remember, he, he was trying to tell somebody not to tell the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and then he didn't tell the truth about his own uh, mm-hmm. issues uh, under oath. I mean, so there were there were perjury questions. You, you go back to the Nixon impeachment. Heck, heck there was cover ups and burglaries and, yeah. you know, all of that. Uh, and, and I'm still unable to find a crime yeah. that Donald Trump has allegedly committed here. We may not like everything he says or does or whatever, but that's, heck, I, that most that, that would describe most presidents uh, one way or another. And indeed, the articles of impeachment that the Democrats drafted don't accuse him of committing a crime. Right. And it seems they were messaging that he had bribery, bribery or we, extortion and that's vanished. Well, and the whole Russian that. thing, I, I, you know, I supported the appointment of Bob Mueller. I, the Bob Mueller I see yeah. today is not the one I saw um, 10 years ago. And, and you've and also I, been willing to vote against the expansion of executive power. I, have. I mean, so you're not you I'm know, both Obama and Trump, line, both yeah. Obama and Trump. Um, I look, I, I'm a, a strong constitutionalist and I believe in the separation of powers. And both President Trump and President Obama uh, decided to use money Congress hadn't uh, authorized for those purposes. We won a lawsuit against Obama. First time the House had ever done that because he had spent money that was not appropriated for that purpose. I believe that part of the transfer that President Trump did for the wall uh, also violated that separation because we had just appropriated money and had a fight over it. And I support building the wall, don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, to then immediately come back and say, well, I'm going to grab this money too, yeah. that's two bites at the apple. That, And the courts are going to decide that. Yeah. There have been two court rulings, I think, said the president doesn't have that authority. And the day that any president has the authority to just go spend money the way they want without congressional approval is a bad day for the Constitution and our separation of powers. The hardest thing is when it's your president yeah. doing something you actually agree with, border security, but not the way. Exactly. And so, yeah, I did. I voted against it. Um, uh, as did I, and for similar reasons. And that was by far my uh, hardest vote. Or yep. I definitely got the most backlash of that yeah. vote. But I think it's a good segue into 
the, uh, the, the issue I want to talk about, which is really separation of powers, the difference between the branches. And I think the primary criticism of Congress as an institution, particularly the modern Congress, uh, and this goes back to the 70s, perhaps even earlier with the growth of kind of the modern presidency, maybe you could date it back to Woodrow Wilson or entry to World War I, is that Article I, which you know the framers worried would become the most powerful branch right. of government, would suck everything into its vortex, has become diminished, and the presidency has grown in power. Mm-hmm. The courts have also grown in power. Would you agree with that sort of fundamental critique of Congress? Mm-hmm. I'm not asking you to accept it. I mean, you, no, I would. You, and in fact, it's in part Congress's fault because we keep giving new authorities to the uh, executive branch, mm-hmm. and through through different legislation. Here we'll have the executive branch do this, and then all of a sudden, the executive branch takes that new authority and uses it in a way that we never had sort of envisioned. Mm-hmm. Go try to take back that executive authority that's been given. It's impossible because you have the, the executive sign off, the president sign off on the legislation that would claw back power you've already given. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a huge lesson going forward for members of both parties is um, protecting the separation of powers uh, in, a, in, in a thoughtful way, recognizing that, yes, it is the administration that implements the law and runs these programs. It's not Congress. But when we give new powers to the executive branch, they're going to use them, and every president will eventually come around to try and to grow the executive authority of the presidency, and uh, because it is set up to be this tussle back and forth Mm -hmm. between our branch and their branch, and, uh, you know, sometimes courts can step in and solve it, and other times courts go, hey, Congress, you, you gave him that authority, he's just using the authority you gave him. Another a related criticism is that prior to your uh, election, uh, the Republicans, when they won power for the first time in decades under Gingrich, right. did a series of things that were intended to sort of drain the swamp, mm-hmm. reducing the staffing size of Congress, yeah. you know, getting rid of the Office of Technical Assessment. And, and the criticism is that paradoxically that actually just mm-hmm. abetted the growth of the federal government because mm-hmm. – the legislators aren't able to conduct oversight relative to the executive branch, which is massive and has an yep. institutional advantage. I, I would agree with that analysis. And at the end of the day, part of uh, diminishing the, the size of government or, or congressional staffs and all was, uh, I would argue, partly politically done, mm-hmm. politically motivated. And I don't think in the end of the day, the voters really cared about that. What they care about is good government. Yeah. What they care about is that their do- tax dollars aren't being wasted or abused or stolen or ripped off. What, what, they, what they want is an efficient government that doesn't get in their way but has a helping hand for those who need it. And, and, and I think we can get there. But I, I was talking to somebody the other day when John Dingell chaired the Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, I, I don't have the exact number, but it was reported that between the the size of his uh, uh, investigative staff on the oversight investigations team could have numbered upwards of 200. 200. Wow. When I chaired the Energy and Commerce Committee, I think we had on the majority side 66 staff to run the entire committee and every subcommittee. Wow. I think he had upwards of 100 or 200 staff just doing oversight investigations. Now, that was on more than just the government side. It's also on the private side. I mean, our committee is the one that, that led the effort investigating Enron. Our committee is the one that, that led the effort looking at uh, the, the Firestone tire and the rollover of, of the vehicles. And I mean, we do a lot of that. Peanut Corporation of America, We I, I was involved in that one where, you know, they'd identified salmonella and peanut paste and went back and resampled and didn't see it and sent it out. That violated the law right there. You can't go back and do that. Mm-hmm. He did it. He did it knowingly sitting in prison, longest prison term for anybody violating the, the Food Safety Act uh, in, in the history of the country, but 11 people died. Wow, wow. Uh, so, I mean, we, it, it, it is an important function doing oversight. We led the effort on the oversight of what went wrong with the opioids crisis in America. Yeah. I mean, I had to threaten literally Donald Trump's attorney general, Jeff Sessions, to his face in the East Room of the White House with a subpoena because we were not getting the data that showed us the distribution chain of the uh, opioids to from the, the, the manufacturers to the distributors to the drug stores themselves. It's called Arcos data. And this should have been a th- these data should have been triggering events for the distributors to see what was happening. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to see, and they didn't want to give it to us. We eventually got it. Mm -hmm. By the way, we never thought about impeaching Donald Trump. Uh, 
because we weren't getting what we wanted. Yeah. Uh, but I did threaten to, to subpoena him, and I did talk to the White House counsel, Don McGann, at the time, and said, Don, I'm serious. I, I, I'll do a subpoena from the committee. We've got to get to the bottom of this, and there's no reason you can't share these data. So let me go to work on it. We eventually got the data. We had a, a, a similar issue, remember, with the Obama administration on the Fast and Furious investigation. Now, that was not our committee. I think that was judiciary. But uh, Eric Holder, then attorney general, refused to turn over the documents. The House held him in contempt of Congress and referred him, I guess, to himself for prosecution. But, of course, they decided not to prosecute him <laughs> since he was the attorney general. Never did we think, though, about impeaching President Obama because we didn't get cooperation on that issue. Yeah. Look, uh, we have this tussle back and forth all the time. You can go to court and settle it. Uh, and, and executive branch has privileges. So do we. Good oversight is is an important function regardless of who's in charge. And and I've, I, I believe that, uh, that that we didn't do enough of that uh, during the Bush presidency. And I'm, I'm a big fan of, of George W. Bush. But we didn't hold the agencies and the programs to the level of accountability we should have. And so my attitude going into this administration is um, we have to always look at and do the oversight of programs and policies to see if the law is being followed and if money is being wasted and mm -hmm. if programs work or not. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've continued to try to be aggressive on oversight. The Dingle story makes me think of another criticism of the modern Congress, which is to say it used to be, uh, particularly uh, prior to the Watergate babies coming in in the 70s, that committee chairs were, were demigods. I mean, they had an unusual amount of power. And that with the yeah. creation of the modern yeah. steering committee, yeah. uh, power has become more tightly concentrated at the top with the speaker and the majority leader. Do you think that's a valid criticism? Or in some ways, it was trying to correct a deficiency because you had a lot correct. of corrupt committee chairs that had too much well, power. Well, and you had no term limits. Exactly. Yet until the Republicans took over, there were no term limits on committee chairs in, in the House. Uh, and that still only applies to our side. We each have our own rules when it comes to how we operate. And uh, so I had a six year limit as Energy and Commerce Committee chair. And that included chair or the top Republican in the minority called a ranking member which I am right now. Mm -hmm. um, so you can only serve six as the top of your party on the committee, either as chairman or ranking. And I think that's that's not bad. Um, I have another two years, even though I'm retiring, to if we were in the majority in, in the next Congress, I could probably come back as chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, but I was just ready to do something else. But um, the other thing that used to go on, I was here in the 80s on staff, not only did the, were the chairman unlimited in terms of terms, but also, they had your proxy. Oh, welcome to the committee, Congressman Gallagher. Now, um, chairman has your vote, and uh, he'll let you know if you need it sort of thing. I mean, the chairman always had the votes of his committee members wow. in, his, in his hand. And, oh, sure, you could go vote against him. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, but whenever you had a vote in the committee, the minority was completely... Uh, left out because it didn't matter whether the majority, the Democrats, uh, were there or not. The chairman had their proxy votes. Wow. So they didn't even have to show up for work. Wow. And so it created this whole chairman, powerful chairman-driven system sure. that didn't have, I think, uh, appropriate checks and balance. Unlimited time there, proxy voting. I mean, it just, it was a one-way street. Now, I should declare, I've made the argument that we've gone overboard. Uh, and per perhaps where you stand depends on where you sit. I sit as a junior member yeah. of Congress, currently, I think, 307th in seniority. Um, 65th. <laughs> but it strikes me that the incentive structure is such that if you want to advance, right, you have to, If you let's say you wanted to become a committee chair one day, you have to do a few things, right? You have to demonstrate you're a team player, defined in a few different ways, and right. then you have to hit your, your fundraising marks. And I'm not sure yeah. that that incentive structure is the best. And I'm wondering if there are ways where we could strike a happy balance between wow. the top-down system we seem to have now and that obviously abused, you know, committee chairman as demigod system we right. had in the past. I, I think so. I don't think there's going to be a perfect solution on yeah. this matter. Um, but I do think uh, it, it's a little like team sport. And, you know, you can be a really good athlete, but if your team doesn't like you or you're not felt to be part of the team, you're probably not going to get the ball much, yeah. you know? And, and, and it's like that. It is, it is a, this is, a, in effect, a team sport. Uh, I chaired the committee, but 
you know, my members, if I got off off uh, where I should be, could have not voted with me on something. Sure. And so I, I tried to uh, to be chairman of a committee where we were unified going in uh, and tried to do bipartisan work. And, and that really meant uh, devolving power to my subcommittee chairs. But I always felt we were all on the same team. Sure. And I didn't need all the credit. I remember one of the first times we went to the House floor with a bill out of our committee, I asked one of the sub-chairs to, uh, to manage the floor. And they said, oh, no, no, the chairman does that. You, you need to do that. You're the chairman of the committee. I said, well, no, you did most of the work on this, the subcommittee. Yeah, I care about this, but you really invested the time. You go do it. And they were, like, astonished because usually full committee chairs go to the floor and carry, you know, do everything uh, on these bills. But I thought, you know what, I'll get a lot more done if I devolve power to my subcommittee chairs, we all stay in good communication, and and we're all on the same team doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, they will be empowered to go do more work, and we will actually produce more good policy. And we did. And if you get bought into the process from the start, yes, you know, they're more willing at the end of the process to That's take right. a tough vote or That's compromise. Right. Uh, I think where people get frustrated, particularly younger members who feel disempowered yeah. is for the committees that don't operate that way. And I'm lucky to serve on yeah. one that does in armed services. And yeah, Mac yeah. Does, yeah. did a He's fantastic a job. job in doing that. But, it, you know, it's like with the appropriations bills, you know, that's you don't get to say a, a lot of your amendments are ruled out of order by the it's rules like committee. Waiting for the new pope. Yeah. You know, just stand <laughs> outside and wait for the smoke. That's right. You know? that's right. Now, I would say that the Kay's done a much better job on our side. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, she's heard that complaint. And uh, and uh, has done a done a good job. Kay Granger from Texas is top Republican. What about okay? You were the head of the National Republican Congressional mm-hmm. Committee, which exists to help uh, Republicans get elected. So you Congress, you know yeah. which uh, to, to get elected to Congress to get the majority, um, so that the team can advance the ball down the field, which also gave you an insight, a unique uh, vantage point on fundraising. Right. Uh, I think one of the things people often complain about is just the demands of fundraising, yeah. which do seem to have grown more onerous. Uh, what do you think is driving that? Do you think that's a valid complaint? How did you balance that in your career? Um, I find it no fun to ask people for money. It's a soul yeah. crushing experience. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you, well. it's I mean, it's you can't not do it. Um, you know, I go back to uh, when I was in radio uh, and we owned these little small market stations, I'd be out pounding the pavement, selling radio ads. And they told us in, in sort of the sales train, you had to get four no's before you get a yes. And you know, lots of other things I'd probably rather have been doing in the radio business than out pounding the pavement trying to get a yes. But it's part of the job. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to be an effective legislator, you've got to get elected. Or it didn't matter, right? You don't have a vote. And if you really want to be effective, then you need to make sure your party uh, is in the majority. And I spent four years in the minority here, and that was enough. And And I, I didn't like where the country was <laughs> headed under Speaker Pelosi at that time, nor, frankly, this time. And, and so I was committed to trying to do something about it. And what you find is there are a lot of people just like you, just like me, who are committed to a philosophy about a smaller government, a more efficient government, uh, you know, go on down the lower taxes, uh, less regulation, uh, kind of what President Trump has initiated. And my gosh, look at the, the economy we have today mm-hmm. as a result. And so I was willing to fight for that. And that means doing things you don't always find. I don't like doing fundraising either. Yeah. Um, but it's part of the job and and it, it always will be. And, and, and I'll tell you that the other piece of this, if if you just don't do it, or I don't do it, the money's still going to get spent. It'll just go further into the shadows. Yeah. Because with the protections of the First Amendment, and they're important protections, um, we have the ability in America to have free speech. And that includes virtually all political speech. And and when McCain-Feingold passed the big reform, uh, you know, 10 years ago or whenever it was, uh, I really worried about that because it, it, it diminished uh, giving to the national parties and incented, in effect, creating all these outside 501 whatevers that a lot of now you would call it dark money gets spent in. And, and I, it, it just is what it is. The money was going to get spent. Mm-hmm. In, in large measure, what, the, what that ref, so-called reform did was drive it into the shadows and away from the parties where it was all disclosed. Even something as common sense and McCain-Feingold as, you know, putting a cap on what you're allowed to donate, 
I think has unintended consequences. In other words, it actually increases the amount of time you have to spend fundraising. If well, the irony yeah. of, of, of campaign finance reform under under McCain Feingold is they doubled what an individual could give yeah. <laughs> in the name of reducing spending or some bizarre thing. So it went from a thousand to two thousand in the primary. And then it was indexed with inflation. So now it's like twenty eight hundred dollars for the primary, twenty eight hundred dollars to general. Yeah. But I, I think that's right and. And, and ironically, when uh, political action committees were established, now they're de- they're they're demonized now, right? Mm-hmm. But they were a growth out of the post Watergate era to get disclosure and limitation on spending. Yeah, they were capped in 1970. I'll say four, five, six, whenever it was, uh, at five thousand dollars for the primary, five thousand for the general. That was never indexed. We are still operating under an amount out of a political action committee, which, by the way, can have no corporate contributions in it, Mm -hmm. as you know. It's all individuals who may work in that company or believe in that industry or that cause. Mm -hmm. Um, It's all their personal money. It goes into a PAC, and that PAC's capped at 5,000 to you, to me, in the primary and in the general, and and never indexed. So to your point, you know, it is it is. uh, it's 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 un, it's an unfortunate part of a, a business, but it's essential to get your word out. Otherwise, nobody knows what you stand for yeah. and who you are. So we have less than ten minutes here. Uh, so you are leaving Congress. Uh, yep. You're abandoning me. I'm field of battle. <laughs> I'm bleeding out. You're well trained. Uh, you're ready to go. You're a warrior. Can I catch you? Uh, why why are you leaving? Why now? And and what do you have you thought about what you're going to do next? I mean, earlier in the in the podcast, we talked about my father got elected to the state legislature in 1970. One way or another, I've been involved in a campaign an election almost every cycle since then. Wow. And uh, I hadn't thought of it in those terms. My wife reminded me, and that's that's 50 years. Um, and and I've been on the ballot or, or in office uh, for 30 of the last 32 years, um, or it will be at the end of this term. I was out for, for two in between. And and it's been great. And I'm not one of those. I'm not one of those members of Congress retiring and going to go on the networks and complain about how awful this place is and all this stuff. And I'm mad and I'm angry and I'm cranky and people are. That's not me. And that's not why I'm relieving. I actually think it's still a wonderful institution. I think uh, it gets beat up on mostly by us and the press more than it deserves. I think, and, and you see this, you're you are able to work across the aisle and get things done. Not as much sometimes as we'd like, but guess what? That's also how the system's set up. But it is still an institution that generally has really talented people elected by their constituents. But, you know, my district's different than yours, Mm -hmm. and ours are different than downtown Portland, and that philosophy is different. That's something I really came to understand uh, when I headed the campaign committee because I was in I don't know how many districts, a lot, hundreds. And I got to understand the members, and I got to see their districts, and it made it gave me a better understanding of why members of Congress are uh, the way they are and act Mm -hmm. the way they act, because guess what? They're coming from different regions and Mm -hmm. different parts of our great country. And they all kind of meld together here and some meld better than others. And as we know, there, there's somebody for everybody in America in the U S house and including criminals. And occasionally, you know, we get a member that gets in trouble of the law and they go off to prison as they should. Um, but I, I've enjoyed the. I love public service. I love solving problems. I like being with people. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm ready to close the chapter on public service, go do something else. Uh, I'll be 63 at the beginning of 2020, and uh, I'm ready to have another chapter, and uh, probably in the private sector. Mm-hmm. Uh, but public service is a terrific calling. Um, it's underrated and, and over-abused, uh, and, and yet... Uh, I, I hope people will continue to, to get involved and stay involved. So with that in mind, what advice would you have for the person that takes your seat when you leave? Oh, listen to the people that sent you here. Mm-hmm. Um, do your homework. Really understand issues you care about. Um, this is, for me, it was never a job to, to get a paycheck and go play golf or something. You know, you, you'll see different members. You're a hard worker. Most of us are. But there are others that just kind of hang out in the yeah. process. You can own any issue you want to own in this business because there's so many things to work on. If you develop an expertise in an area or an issue, you, you'll be seen as the expert, and, and you don't even have to be on the committee of jurisdiction. Um, and I, I really think never forget where you came from. Let, go back home and stay in touch. If I if I spend a weekend or more here, um, I I get home and I think, gosh, I, I just feel nervous if I don't get back to my district. And I've done 623 round trips in 21 years. So it's almost every it's week flight. to the West Coast and three-hour time zones. But it's how I stayed in touch. It, it's where I got my to-do list. 
And I, I think that's an essential piece of this. Okay, final question for Greg Walden. What do you do for fun when you're not? Oh, I like to ski. My wife and I both like to downhill ski. Um, we have a camper and a pickup that doesn't get enough use, but hopefully uh, when I leave office, it will be used more. We went with my brother and, and sister-in-law up to, to Canada last summer uh, to a lake they've been going to for years. We, we went up with them for the first time and caught these big, beautiful trout um, and got away and off the grid. There's no cell service or internet. It was a wonderful thing. Um, and, and so we like the outdoors. We like to hike. We like to uh, fish. We like to, um, you know, uh, just camp and, and downhill ski and, you know, all those sorts of things. Uh, we're, my wife and I are both a little, I'm a little bit into music. She's deeply into it and is always trying to get me to learn some new instrument. Uh, so we're learning the mountain dulcimer right now. <laughs> I, I will not play it for you here. I don't have it and I'm not that good at it. But uh, so music's part of our life. Um, yeah. So. That's great. Well, Congressman Greg Walden, thank you for your time. Thank you for your service thank in you. Congress. Uh, thank you for being uh, our first interview. I don't even know. <laughs> we still haven't fleshed this out. We may just bury all these in a capsule <laughs> yeah. so when future civilizations dig it up, they can sort of understand. Oh, those people you know. were really yeah, strange. That's, that's right. <laughs> that's right. But in all seriousness, sir, we really, really appreciate well, it. Well, thank thanks you. for your service. Thanks for doing this. All right. That's it. Thank you for listening. The dude. Yeah. The dude. 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 The dude